well good morning dear so welcome back so we are discussing some um, multiple choice questions so that you can easily digest the, the concept which we have already studied okay so this is a very interesting um, multiple choice question and as you know and i have several lectures on this uh, the question is like this to avoid gimbal lock situation in robot gripper orientation description quaternion are being increasingly used in place of euler angle okay euler angle description and quaternion is as you know represented uh, i have explained right um by four parameters x y z and w these are all real quantity okay x y z and w first three are assigned along three orthogonal imaginary axis i j and k and the fourth one w is along a real axis now if i equals to j equals to k equals to root over of minus 1 what will be the value of i j k so that's the question to answer this there is a history i uh, i have already talked and let me also um, uh, repeat here see this is the gentleman uh, this is uh, william rohan hamilton in 1843 16th october when he was crossing a bridge with his family he was thinking about uh, the quaternion for a long time but all on a sudden this thing came to his mind and he wrote down the equation on the stone itself what is that equation i square equals to j square equal to k square equal to i j k equals to minus 1 so i have told here it will be minus 1 um, but how we are going to tell you that all of you perhaps are conversant with um, con uh, complex quantity right so suppose you have a uh, in argon diagram um, you have a real axis you have an imaginary axis you call it imaginary axis where i is there and any complex quantity can be represented in argon diagram right by say if it is um, 2 plus um, i that means what it has a real component in along real axis and it has a component 1 uh, along imaginary axis this thing you all everybody know in class 12 what he wanted to do he wanted to extend the idea of this complex quantity in a four dimensional space you see here this is i j k all of them i j k equals to root over of minus 1 okay and this is w okay um which is uh, actually uh, this vector is perpendicular so these are all orthogonal vector right i j k complex quantity so this is a four dimensional space four dimensional space huh so that is his contribution he uh, just defined quaternion equals to xi plus yj plus zk plus w this is the quaternion and during that time you know people just uh, many in the scientific community so unnecessarily he is just um, uh, complicating the thing and he was obsessed with quaternion he formed a quaternion society because he envisioned that one day it might have a very uh, good application in orientation description and it turns out to be today eh? today um, game designer and all programmer they love using quaternion representation for orientation and not eulerian representation for orientation reason you know in several lectures i have discussed that gimbal lock is the most um, um, most common uh, limitation of uh, euler angle because once my gripper or an aircraft 
is in the gimbal lock situation, then control uh, torque generating will be extremely difficult, if not impossible, right? So this is a very nice idea about uh, quaternion, uh, and all my um, team now we use extensively quaternion for representing uh, orientation. Uh. So what will be the correct answer? You see here, uh, people may think, okay, i j k uh, equals to root over minus one. So what is i j k? i times j times k equals to root over of minus one into root over of minus one into root over of minus one equals to minus one minus one minus root over of minus one, which is incorrect, right? Why? You try to understand. It will be, he engraved it, okay? He defined it. Yeah? And it is coming from uh, this construction of the quaternion four dimensional space. So, what is IJ? Orthogonal um, coordinate axis, okay? All are orthogonal. I orthogonal to J, J orthogonal to K, K orthogonal to I, and this, this is also orthogonal mutually to all this axis, okay? Which you may not visualize in 3D because it's a four dimensional space. So, I cross J equals to K, isn't it? I cross J equals to K. Similarly, uh, J cross K equals to I, right? And then K cross I equals to J. Right? So he just extended to uh, one um, dimension of the imaginary axis with another two. And that actually made, uh, you see, J, K, so these are all huh? his, his creation. And then uh, representation um, has now four dimension, right? Okay. So that's the only thing he, he did, but remarkable thing which he did. So you see, for, uh, these are from the orthogonality criteria. So ij equals to k. Now, compute ijk, okay? ijk. What I can write in terms of ij, I can write k. So, in terms of this, this is equals to k into k equals root over of minus 1 into root over of minus 1 equal to minus 1. So, ijk equals to minus 1. Similarly, if you just um, put uh, jk, uh, jk equals to i, so i jk also equals to i times i equals to root over of minus 1 times root over of minus 1 equal to minus 1 huh? or whatever i i j k you can also you see um, k i k i equals to j. So, k i equals to j, j, j equals to root over of minus 1, root over of minus 1, equals to minus 1, okay? So, i, um, i, j, k always can be written into the form of minus 1. So, that's why correct answer is this, not this, okay? Apparently, whatever you can see that this is the correct answer, it is not. So that clarifies the concept of quaternion. Now, next question. If a solid cube is floating in a 3D space described by a 3D orthogonal coordinate frame, what will be its degrees of freedom? So this is very simple, uh, not for mechanical engineers, okay, for others. Say, I have a rigid body here. Rigid body has finite shape, right? It's 3D rigid body, and it is floating in, um, 3D space. That means my hand is not there. So what are the degrees of freedom it has? It can translate along X, it can translate along Y, and it can translate along Z. Okay. So these are the three. For example, its center of mass has X, Y, Z. But being in the same position, it can have orientation like this, or it can have orientation like this, or it can have orientation like this. So three additional orientation also required to completely capture 
that rigid body in 3D space. So, how many degrees of freedom? Three for translation and three for orientation. Okay. So, correct answer is six. Clear. Okay. Now, next question. If a solid body of any shape is constrained to move on a plane, then how many degrees of freedom it has? Now say, this is my plane, and same object which was earlier floating, now is constrained to move on the table or on this plane, right, to the plane. So how many degrees of freedom it has? Only three. All the other three is gone. Why? Because being constrained to be on this table, it can have only motion along x, means along y, means any two orthogonal, along any two orthogonal uh, coordinate axis, and it can rotate about z. It cannot rotate about x, y, because you see, constant is violated. It is not anymore on the 2D table. So I think um, you understand. So. When I am putting this constraint that it has to be on the two-dimensional table, it loses immediately three degrees of freedom. Okay, it has now um, two translation, one rotation. Similarly, so these are the exercise problems, very sim simple, uh, at least for mechanical engineers. The cylindrical object is constrained to move along V group. So how many degrees of freedom it might have? So you have a V group now, V group, yeah, and a cylindrical object is there, like pain. So being constrained to move, um, to be on the V group, it can only translate along its axis, and it can rotate about its axis. All other uh, motion will violate that it, it will no more be on the V group. So it will have two degrees of freedom, okay? This is the correct answer, huh? okay? So, now, Puma is the abbreviation of Programmable Universal Machine for Assembly. So, this is actually a memory game, uh, whether you know or not. Eh? Uh, so, his answer is, okay, uh, the Programmable Universal Machine for Assembly. Programmable universal machine for assembly. Okay. C is correct answer. A manipulating robot is a serial kinematic chain, an open serial kinematic chain, a closed kinematic chain, a combination of open and closed kinematic chain. What is a manipulating robot? As you know, huh? base is fixed. So this is a serial kinematic chain. One link connected with other links, another link, another link. And one end is free. I mean, this is only constrained. This is actually anchored on the ground. And other end is uh, free. Okay, It's not like this. And in design, mechanical engineering, you have lots of such uh, mechanisms. So this is closed kinematic chain. So this is open kin serial kinematic. Again, uh, for mechanical engineers, this is very simple, but for others, it is uh, information worth noting. Okay, so it is a open serial kinematic chain. Okay, so B is the correct answer. Now, the two important concept. Now, we'll talk about that. The repeatability of an industrial robot is all about how precisely an industrial robot can return to a top point to achieve high repeatability, um, okay, top point, right? Now to achieve high repeatability, a manipulator must solve inverse kinematics, must use stitch pendant mode and solve forward kinematics, okay? Solve trajectory planning, must use dynamic model. So what is repeatability? I need, uh, I need to tell you, hmm. say I have a robot. And I have asked to move at a point 
uh, x in 2D, for example. Now, repeatability means I solve forward kinematics and say, or by t dependent mode, I manipulate it on the joint and I have brought that end effector at a position, desired position x and when it has reached, I have memorized all the values of the joint angle. Now, I am repeating it, say, for 100 times. If a robot has good repeatability, then it will, end effector will always move in the vicinity of x, okay? Sometimes here, sometimes here, sometimes here, sometimes here, very close. If it is a, uh, you see, target, uh, you will see the bullseye is our destination, then it will be almost, if the robot has high uh, repeatability, uh, it solves the forward kinematics or memorize the joint angle and reach the air if it has high repeatability. Now, if it has high repeatability, even uh, say it is making some error, say I have not used very sophisticated uh, actuator or very sophisticated manufacturing uh, facility to precisely um, design this uh, laying, uh, say, okay, it's a, it's a low cost robot, but I have ensured that the tot point and the uh, vibration is less somehow and tot points are memorized perfectly uh, and I have in doing that I have ensured that it has a good repeatability but it may not have accuracy means suppose I have asked robot to move x but repeatably it is moving a little bit away from x say at this position okay this is now shifting off uh, the target because of some manufacturing error, not so sophisticated design, I um, mean uh, manufacturing, not so sophisticated actuators. But if it has a good repeatability, then always it will, instead of going here, it will go x y. Okay. And it turns out that even this is also fine because, you see, if I know that this is my desired target and this is my actual, uh, this is my this is my desired target and this is my actual target, okay, that is x prime, okay. If I know that it is always making an error E, means it is not going sometimes x uh, uh, you know, prime here and sometimes here, no, that's a poor repeatability it has. But if it has a good repeatability, even it, it make mistake, where I told you, uh, told the robot to go, it is going somewhere else. and if I can know, in that sense, I can know the error, then by programming, I can correct, I can use the robot very accurately. How, you know, now I want robot to move X. And I know robot is moving something uh, less than uh, X, right? So I will ask robot to move, instead of moving to X, x uh, prime plus the error okay or other way around if uh, wherever it need to go it is going um, more than what it required to go so i need to add program instead of asking robot to go x i will ask it to go x minus that error which it is always making for that of course error um, should follow uh, very stringent criteria, error may be Gaussian, which uh, uh, means all kind of, uh, if this is repeatability, the concept is this, right? So, uh, it should be, error should be like, even if it is following Gaussian, it should be, it should not be more, okay? Like that, it should not be flat like that, okay? So, if the error is like this, and then we can actually um, use high repeatability robot for my precise uh, action, means reaching precisely some point. So it solves um, forward kinematics, okay? And next question is, so answer B is the correct one. The precision with which a computed point can be achieved by a robot is its accuracy. 
to achieve high accuracy at about mass solve inverse kinematics accurately with calibration. You see, to achieve high accuracy, you need uh, good actuator, good controller, sophisticated robot. It will cost more, okay? So it needs to solve inverse kinematics accurately and calibration should be there so that always, wherever I want a robot to move, if it has a great accuracy, very accurately, it should be able to move there, okay? So this is the concept of having uh, high accuracy, high replicability, okay? So which one you will prefer? If you have uh, less money, first one, you should go for a robot which has high repeatability at least, huh? because the rest of the thing by programming you can uh, correct, okay, you can use it. Very nice. So next question is, compounding two orthogonal rotation matrix for describing robot orientation require 27 multiplication and 12 addition, 16 multiplication and 12 addition, 27 multiplication and 18 addition, 16 multiplication and 18 addition. So you need to know that because in robot, you see tons of matrices are always inverted, multiplied, so computations are heavy in real time, you know, uh, because it is a moving, right? So it's a moving structure. So in homogeneous coordinate transformation matrix, all the uh, individual matrices are a function of uh, theta, if it is a revolved joint, or if it's a prismatic joint, it's a function of di, right? So, tons of some matrices requires to be computed, either multiplied or inverted, okay? And uh, you know, in, for inversion, we use its structure, uh, because lots of inversions required, and computation in a friendly way we'll have to do. So, let us see that for computation of three by three matrix, let us assume A is this matrix, A11, A12, A13, three cross three matrix, and let us see B, B11, B12, B13, A212. So this is three cross three matrix. And I am making this, um, two ortho and these are two orthogonal uh, matrices. You know the orthogonality property, right? Okay. So if I am multiplying, if you know, uh, or don't know, of course, you will have to listen to my lecture. Uh, so A and B, I am multiplying. So first element will be A11, B11, plus A12, B21, A1 plus A13, B31. So this is the first element. Likewise, you, you know, right, how to do the matrix, multiplication. So for each element, so and how many elements are there? Nine, one, two, three, four. So resultant matrix will be also three cross three. That means there will be nine elements. Now each element involves how many multiplication? One, two, three. So multiplication equals to three. And how many addition? One, two. Addition. So how many additions are there? So for each element, this is how many elements? Nine elements are there. So multiplied by nine, multiplied by nine. So 27 multiplication and 18. Nine into two, 18 addition should be there for multiplying, for compounding two orthogonal rotation matrix. See which one? Um, 27, 18, okay. So is the correct answer, okay, C. Okay, now, quaternion form of compounding two orthogonal matrices for describing robot orientation requires how many computations and how many additions? Eh? And as you know, so that's why you need to listen to quaternion lecture. For compounding two orthogonal matrix in quaternion, I need to multiply a 4 cross 4 matrix with a 4 cross 1 uh, vector, right? Okay. So, again, if I multiply this matrix with this matrix B, okay, so single column matrix is called a vector as you know, both are matrix actually. 
so I am multiplying them and then resultant uh, vector will be 4 cross 1 or matrix will be 4 cross 1. So now for each element you see multiply again a11 into b11 plus a12 into b21 plus a13 into b31 plus a14 into b41. So this is first element of a 4 plus 1 vector. So how many additions are there and how many uh, multiplication? So one multiplication, two, three, four. So multiplication equals to four per element, right? And how many addition? One, two, three. Addition equals to three. Eh? So three addition, four multiplication. And how many elements are there? Four. So you multiply it by four. So how many total multiplication will be there? 16. How many total addition will be there? 12. Huh? Let us see. Is there anything like that? Yes. 16 multiplication, 12 addition. Huh? So you see, isn't it great? It's saving. Huh? See, multiplication earlier uh, in Eulerian uh, multiplication or rotation matrix, 3 cross 3 rotation matrix, if you multiply, then you require 27 multiplication, 18 addition. If you use quaternion, you require, um, for the same thing, you require 16 multiplication, 12 addition. So, it's a great saving, right? 11 multiplication per uh, mat uh, you, you, you are saving, right, per matrix. 11 multiplication you are saving and 6 addition you are saving, multiplication saving is a great thing eh? and this is not one, right? So these are the functions of um, time, all the uh, elements inside the matrix. So it's a huge, huge saving. So that's why another advantage of quaternion. Okay? So with this, um, I think some MCQ, through MCQ, some concepts uh, got further digested what I have already discussed. And, and then again, we'll add more con uh, content and we'll do some MCQ afterwards. So, stay safe, have a nice day, bye-bye. If you have any question, come to the discussion forum or uh, uh, comment in the comment box. Uh, you can email me also. Okay. Great. Thank you.